Hello, everybody. Welcome, everyone, to Fireside Chats, Grants, Identifying the Right Opportunities, and Managing the Process. It's with gratitude and respect that we acknowledge the lands on which Foresight operates are the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territories of the First Nations, Inuit, and Métis people. And as for myself, I'm speaking to you from Calgary, which is within the Treaty 7. These are the traditional lands of the Blackfoot Confederacy, the Siksika, Gini, Pikani First Nations, the Sedina First Nation, and the Stony Nakoda First Nation. Here is the agenda for the day. We have an experienced panel here. We will have panel introductions and a moderated Q&A. Please use the Q&A option to post your questions. Before we start, I want to say a few words about Foresight. Foresight is Canada's clean tech accelerator, and our goal is to make Canada the first G7 to reach net zero. We work tirelessly to position Canada as a global leader in clean technology. We bring together clean tech innovators, industry partners, investors, government, and academia to address today's most urgent climate issues and support a global transition to a green economy. Here is our panel today. Unfortunately, we don't have uh, Macarena with, uh, with us yet, but as soon as she joins, we'll have another uh, panel member. Uh, let's start with uh, our introductions uh, with Yasser Roshan as the first uh, panelist. Over to you, Yasser. Okay. Thank you very much, Nisha. Um, hi, everyone, and good morning or good afternoon, depending on where you are. My name is Yasser Roshan. I'm a Senior Manager of Research Partnership with the Faculty of Applied Science at UBC. Uh, my background is mostly in electrical engineering or almost all of it is electrical engineering. I, uh, before joining UBC, I also work with uh, MyTax, which uh, as uh, uh, at least a few of you know, um, it's a funding organization helping uh, researchers from the universities and the startup industries uh, to, to be connected together. Now in my current role at UBC, I'm practically doing the same thing, but from the university perspective. So I'm helping our researchers to be connected to external industries. And of course I'm help, helping them towards um, navigating um, within the funding mechanisms that are available out there. Happy to be here and happy to answer your questions. Thank you. Thank you, yes, sir. Hi, uh, my name is Greg. I'm uh, the managing partner at Avenue Public Affairs. Uh, Avenue Public Affairs is government relations a consulting firm that works operates across Canada. Um, for myself, I've worked in pretty much every role uh, there is in government, except for the Governor General's office, uh, from senior public service to uh, to different political and, and ministerial roles. Um, and so, our team brings a really sort of deep knowledge of uh, government operations and decision making processes uh, in order to uh, support our clients uh, to have success with government. And in the case of conversation today. Um, around funding, but we also do regulatory change as well. I'm happy to be here spending uh, time with you and talking about grants, which are very important when you are in a startup. Um, Macarena Cataldo, co-founder and CEO of Fidelity Research. We are a water tech company, um, a startup company, and um, we are developing technologies for capturing and degrading microplastics. And I'm happy to be here. Hi. <laughs> hey, Thank Macarena. You. Yeah. Yeah. Thank and you. over to you, James, Yeah, for an introduction and moderating the session. Thanks, Nisha. Welcome, everyone, uh, for our latest session on uh, our fireside chats with respect to grant funding and non-dilutive funding. Obviously, um, being able to fund operations is exceptionally important, and this is uh, no different. I think our vendor may have been able to join us back. So let's just test to see if he can give his introduction and then we can move on to our Q&A. Hello, everyone. Yes, I'm able to join in. <laughs> Sorry about this light issue. I still can't uh, share my video with you. My apologies. Uh, <laughs> so uh, I'm an advisor, like uh, industrial technology advisor with National Research Council of Canada, IRAP division. And um, uh, quickly, my background is in engineering and business. And uh, uh, we'll talk about what IRAP does later on. Um, but quickly, uh, I have worked in uh, small and medium enterprises, large MNEs. My background is very varied uh, from um, advanced materials, nonlinear dynamics, computations, consumer products. And for the last uh, 10, 14 years, I have been working with energy systems, including oil and gas, clean tech, carbon capture and utilization. Uh, hopefully uh, I'll be useful in today's conversation. 
Uh, thanks, Arvinder. So uh, today we're going to talk about um, how to do this, why you do it, what are common mistakes, and what I think I'd like to start with is, yeah, sir, uh, and and uh, this will be for the whole panel, but I'd like you to start by if you could uh, tell uh, the audience what in your view is a key factor in setting up uh, ability to raise non-dilutive capital for for the for a company what are those where would you first want to look and what is it that's important to make sure you do to set yourself up to be able to raise that okay that's a that's a Bit of a general question, um, but I can I can definitely start, and and definitely other panelists can add to that. Um, so I think the best resource to take a look in and get an understanding of what is available out there, because that's the first step to understand what is available out there, how different mechanisms work, because they are all coming with their own advantages and drawbacks in a sense. Uh, they are all coming with their own process. They're all coming with their own timelines. Uh, and, and competition. So in order to understand how this work and what is the best one and, and select what are the best ones for your company, I think there, uh, there needs to be a resource uh, that you can take a look at. And the best resource that at least I can say, and maybe others can add to that is the ISET Business Benefits Finder website. Uh, that is practically a website that you tell your story and it gives you a list of I don't know, hundreds of different fundings available out there in Canada. Um, and I can actually put a link to that in the chat after this. But um, so I think that's the first step. Um, one of the things that I want to, and again, going back to my experience in my text, I'm working with many startup companies. What I want to like tell you is to just try to avoid um, tuning what you do to one of the funding mechanisms that you think might be good. Um, so like you, you need to completely understand what is it that you want to do and then go dig into that list of hundreds of funding opportunities so that they can help you, not you tune your work towards them. And that's a, that's a mistake that I've seen many startups doing, especially when they're coming to work with universities, because there are lots and lots of different uh, leverages and non-dilutive fundings that, that support startups working with universities. And many times they actually don't need that work. They are just doing it so that they can use the funding. Um, so that is the main thing that I would say, um, try to avoid as much as you can. Um, but other than that, just take a look at the resources that are available out there, select a few that works for you, for your timeline, for your product, um, and then, and then just, just go and apply for them. That's basically the starting point. Macarena, it's, it's build on that from your experience, like you've got that whole laundry list of entities. How did you work your way through which ones that you wanted to go? So figuring a way through the jungle. So I think that you have to create a strategy around grants. Uh, grants. Um, different grants require different uh, level of technology development, level of uh, complexity. So uh, what I, what we do at Vididis, we uh, have a calendar with the different grants that we are able to apply. So if you know the requirements uh, of a grant that is in the line of grants that are um, useful for you, um, you can start working in those requirements before, so you have a, a more compelling application when it's the time. At the same time, I think that it's very important to build a relationship with the different uh, granting organizations. It's not that you start with uh, from one day to other to one million. You start maybe with 20,000, then 100, and then 500, and at some point it's one million. So uh, build trust between the organizations, uh, collaborate with them, People uh, um, in charge of um, these grants in general are very open to share information and even help you with your own application. Uh, I, I, what I could like to suggest is not, uh, not done kind of uh, fake information just to get the money because this is not going to help to your, to your future relationship with the organizations and institutions and be prepared, uh, map, what you need and as well if you need to a fundraise to get a matching fund uh, organized in advance for all these kind of uh, possibilities that is my okay. advice Thanks, for Greg. that Greg, Greg do you, you want to add on to that yeah I think all that's right um, you know the risk management piece that the biggest fear that government has is creating a political problem um, and so starting early and starting often with government 
Um, and starting with programs, and I'm going to keep throwing uh, props to IRAP and our vendor all day, um, but uh, but programs that have that stewarded, that, there aren't many. Um, so IRAP has a really great process where they'll, they'll walk you through the process. Um, and so engage in programs like that early um, so that when you get to a point where you're talking about you know, the business scale productivity program or the strategic innovation fund, which are larger funds, um, you're not going and talking to government for the first time and asking them for five or $10 million, <laughs> you know, there, which is, which is a huge risk uh, for them to take on. Um, you know, instead you're, you, you've taken the time, you've built that trust, you've educated government about what it is that you do. Uh, and, and, and Macarena's point around trust is, is really the most important piece of any conversation you're going to have. Um, if you break that trust, uh, there's, it's really difficult to come back from if it's achievable. And certainly when you're talking about uh, programs that, that offer millions of dollars, um, if they don't trust you, you're never going to get it. Uh, so, so making sure that you build that relationship in good faith from the beginning. Uh, thanks, Rick. Uh, Arvinder, that, that's not true that the, the, all these organizations talk to each other, is that? Really? Like you, you actually do converse with the different ones or is it you're on your own? We work very closely with the, the ecosystem partners. Uh, that includes other non-dilutive uh, organizations as well as, you know, private investors playing in the field. So I would, uh, so what shall uh, an SME do to get funding? You know, yes, uh, Macarena and Greg have spoken about it. I would say, stay, you know, go keep, you know, participate in the ecosystem, you know, network uh, and uh, know and uh, your value proposition, uh, it, but your value proposition is gonna, you know, evolve as, as uh, you know, you work on your idea from, you know, lower tier level to higher tier levels and uh, build around it. But, uh, you know, have conversations, right? and make sure that you are not just solving a technical problem, you are doing something to resolve, to address a business pain point. Um, just as a reminder to all the panelists and the guests, please use the Q&A uh, to ask your questions because we can actually address them as they're going. Now, Arvinder, and, and you guys all talked about uh, I was just sorry for the tongue in cheek. I know that you guys all talk to each other. All the firms talk to each other, and truly, Arvinda, you're making an investment in these companies, and you're bridging these. Uh, whether you call it a valley of death, you're bridging where, say, dilutive capital won't go. Um, how do you actually? manage that where you know that you're looking for that return and you're trying to move this forward and you see those opportunities, um, but it's maybe someplace that is maybe too early for the uh, the investors of dilutive capital, but it's actually, that's a key element of how you bring the capital together. So thoughts on on that, vendor, and then we'll, we'll get to the others. How do you, how do you bring those students together? Uh, okay, uh, so let me give you some numbers. I think that would be better, right? So that uh, you know what kind of companies we invest in, and uh, and then we can start talking about you know, um, it you know uh, if you're small, if you're starting out, you know if you can get what kind of funding, right? What so um, the numbers I have is like. Uh, uh, 45% of the firms that received IDA funding in the last fiscal year had less than 10 employees, right? 45%. 84% of the firms that received IDA funding had less than 50 FTEs, okay? So those are the numbers. So we, start, we work with companies which are at early stages. The main focus is gonna be if you are solving, if you're trying to solve or address an industry need, right? So it is, uh, our program is discretionary program. It's not an entitlement program. Our resources are limited. Though we invest, you know, half, half a billion dollars every year in SMEs. I'm gonna repeat it. 
half a billion dollars, $500 million every year. We support uh, uh, about 2,000 SMEs every year across Canada. It's a big number. So, uh, uh, you know, we are in this business, IRAP, in which uh, uh, we participate where uh, VCs may not want to part, you know, participate uh, early. We, so we are inclined on taking higher risk. And uh, the best way, the best way to find out if you if you are going to get support from us is to connect with one of my colleagues. You know, we are 260 folks spread across Canada in 106 locations. So we are everywhere. So uh, that it, it starts with a conversation. Okay. Um, there are some questions that are, uh, yeah. Uh, there's an interesting question that came in the chat, uh, and I'm going to put it back to your vendor, and then we want to move on. But so uh, Greg actually made a really important comment about uh, how does political risk factor into any of these decisions? Does it or doesn't it? Um, and, uh, you know, I'd probably say that uh, this is a, a you're looking for being able to move the needle in the areas that are important from your guys' assessment. So how do you, how do companies engage with you before they're even necessarily ready to build those relationships? Actually, let's, let's uh, go to Macarena on that. How do you actually engage with those entities before you're actually even asking for money to, to build those relationships, to build the trust so that they're interested in you? How did you address that? Is it uh, James? Is it me or Macarena? I was hoping Macarena would okay. comment on that. So, um, in my case, I'm sure this is a magical solution for everyone. But I try to uh, learn as much as I can about the different organizations. In that way, you can learn how to collaborate with them, uh, what you can get from them, and what they need from you. So it's like understanding the vision, mission, and how they operate can help to uh, um, establish a relationship. And uh, I try to connect with them at earliest. Uh, I started relationship with SEDC with a pre-seed round uh, with my seed in my seed round uh, because I got um, their seed round, their seed money, and from them. Even if we still don't apply to the big SDDC grant, we keep in, con uh, in constant um, conversations. They know how we have been progressed during the last year. So, um, and they are helping us to get everything uh, together for the next application too. So what I suggest is like a, a learn about uh, every organization. And if you go to the website, even uh, around Vancouver, um, I'm not sure if everyone is from DC, but, it's uh, different organizations, different accelerators are always um, organizing uh, meetings with uh, uh, IRAP representative, my tax representatives, SDTC, uh, different um, organizations that provide grants. So it's uh, if you get in touch with them, if you go, if you learn a little bit, um, and then I start from uh, from that, uh, it's going to be easier that if you never meet anyone and just call for, hey, uh, can you help me with my grant? So it doesn't work in that way. Uh, so learn about um, how to engage with each organization, uh, what are they for, because there are organizations, let's say for uh, the final stage of your product development, there are other ones that are better for uh, research. So like a how, try to manage all the sources in a good way, but that is just communicating with them and uh, learning from them. Okay, Greg. Um when you work with uh, companies and, and you take a very different approach because you're actually building these relationships, do you want to comment on that the relationship building approach uh, at the early stage and and how that how you've seen it impact companies' ability to work with these different organizations? Sure, I, I would say building and and in some cases repairing. Um, but uh, but a lot of the organizations that we work with have relatively complex policy files and don't always communicate them extremely well to government decision makers. It's worth, you know, with the exception of folks who have a, 
uh, an engineering background like Yasser or uh, I believe an electrical background like Arbinder. Um, the, uh, you know, most folks in, in, uh, in government have, uh, less technical backgrounds, um, and they're making decisions as professional, uh, policy, uh, professional policy people, uh, or professional, uh, public servants, uh, which is a skill set in its own right. Um, but they don't necessarily, you know, if you're coming to them with a frictionless flywheel, um, or a, uh, you know, a, a, a hydro store has a really cool, not to get hydro store a shadow, but hydro store has a really cool, um, uh, uh, energy storage system that that basically uses, I won't explain it, but it's complicated is my point. Um, and so when you're coming to folks who have uh, technical knowledge and expertise uh, in uh, making decisions around public policy and, and, and public programs, uh, programs are funding policy as policy, um, uh, they may not have the technical expertise to do a deep dive or have a, a really complex understanding of the file in the way that that the people on this uh, watching this panel might. Um, so being able to communicate that in a way that one speaks to or makes it clear how you fit into the program and is easy to understand, but two speaks to the objectives of the programs. Um, you know, these programs aren't just created for sport or for fun. They were they're set to achieve specific policy objectives. Um, uh, and that's what government is spending money on, is trying to achieve these objectives. Um, so when you're talking about, uh, um, uh, you know, and, and I won't name specific programs, but when you're talking about engaging these programs, the first question to ask is, what is it trying to achieve? Explaining who you are and what you do in a way that, you know, a Labrador retriever would understand. Uh, and, then, uh, uh, and then speaking to the, the program objectives of that fund. Um, you you mentioned something that I, I actually want uh, had, uh, Yasser to comment on and talk about is which is the uh, the part about repairing these relationships. Um, so obviously you'd prefer not to have to repair, but Yasser, what have you seen that has actually caused uh, damage that really causes you an issue with respect to grant applications, uh, non dilutive funding? Uh, and and how can parties avoid making those fundamental mistakes? Yeah, I can I can <clears throat> I can talk about it from um, the the non dilutive fundings that are focused on uh, working with like universities and like academia and industry type of funding that are available out there. I can talk about it from that perspective. And the main two issues that I've seen in the last few years that I've been working in this area um, are. One uh, is for the companies, especially the startup companies, to not understand exactly how academics work um, because academics research, of course, they do provide some value, like there are, there are scientific values that they can provide, they can validate what you are working on, or they can be like a relatively inexpensive way of like getting some resources in order to work with. But at the same time, their timelines and the commitments that they need are different than like you go out there and, and hire a research services company or something like that. So it's very important to understand that the timelines are different, academics are slower, um, and, and that's, a, that's a reality. So you can't, um, you can't just go out there and 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 anticipate that a, like a complex project can be done in a couple of months in an academic board. It takes even more than that to get a proposal approved. So it's very important to understand how the timelines work. And I've seen lots of frictions happening just because this fact is not being understood at the beginning. And that's exactly why my role exists so that I can translate the, the timelines of the two sides together or, or they can actually talk to each other. That's one point. And the second point that comes to my mind, again, a source of many frictions is uh, the, the negotiations around IPs or patents or copyrights or anything that comes or even licenses out of universities, uh, anything that comes through that discussion. So it's very important. And again, uh, another reason that my role exists is to just make sure that everyone understands how these negotiations work, how what is their university rolling, how what are the um, the rules about different funding mechanisms on this on the IP issues, which is because each one of them is different. So it's very important, especially for startups, that IP is an important part of them. Um, it's very important to understand how universities work to avoid getting into problems later on. I've seen projects that they have been around uh, for like a year. They have been trying to get a proposal approved, and as soon as it's approved, they have they, they just suddenly started discussing IP, which was too late, and and it fall, fall fell apart. So that's the main two two things that they can think about beforehand in order to fix that relationship or not getting into conflicts. And and I can see that being a major issue when it comes into 
uh, diluted funding because the investors are going to want to know where the IP resides. And, exactly. and so you could actually end up causing a problem for yourself if you cannot have a clear path to owning of that as you're working with the organization. So you need to set that up front. Exactly. I mean, I'd like you to actually build on that. Uh, and from one really specific angle, like uh, actually I'd like you to deal with the fatal flaws that you've seen where we just don't want companies to, to do that. But I'd also like you to touch on from the perspective of when we, a lot of companies here that early stage and they're raising dilutive capital, they, their investors are gonna be, uh, if they're US investors, maybe pulling them to, to move to the US. And what is it that they need to contemplate uh, as they're working with um, IRAP and how that could play into it or not play into it? So the interrelationships of where those companies are located and uh, just addressing some fatal flaws that you've seen. Well, okay. so that's a loaded question. So I just want to step back a little bit uh, because the question started with the relationship and all that. Uh, SMEs need to know that uh, INRC IRAP is not a funding program. We are primarily an advisory and networking services. That's what we provide. We are, uh, there are 260 colleagues of mine across Canada. We are engineers and scientists and people like James who come from VC background. So our goal, what we want working with SMEs is to grow SMEs through our advisory, networking and financial contribution. So it's a whole thing, right? So companies desiring to a, you know, raise funds from us, right? I always tell the you know clients that I work with, you will get a lot of advisory and networking services from us before you get a sing see a single loony, right? So that is really important, right? If you are coming to us for money, you may be disappointed, right? Because so keep that in mind. Now the question, the latest question is, uh, 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 companies being pulled into US. So uh, what we, so it goes back to what we want. We are leveraging, we are investing Canadian taxpayers' money into SME. So I just wanna put it out there, right? It's taxpayers' money. So what taxpayers want, or what our program wants is to grow revenue in the Canadian entity and increase employment in the Canadian entity. So when you are discussing uh, with, I would say any government organization, provincial or federal, they will be asking, hey, what are the benefits to Canada, right? So if you are just a cost center to a bigger company, which is a foreign company, a, a company then you need to make sure that those benefits to Canada are real and you can stand behind it. At the end of the day, we want to grow companies in Canada. The, the revenues can come from anywhere, from anywhere in the world, but employment growth and revenue and profitability growth and investment, investment in R&D of those revenues need to be in Canada. So the, the idea to move to the US isn't like if there's a proper business reason behind it, it's not going to stop the relationship with you so long as there is a real benefit in Canada. And so, you don't, that's, that's absolutely yes. has to be clear in the, the messaging. Uh, yes. Macarena, when, um, when you were working with some of the different funding organizations, um, I know we've had says tits not name names, but this, let's actually start naming names. Like they, they all have their different objectives. They do have, and Gregory's uh, smiling, so I'm going to be really interested in picking on him afterwards as to which ones did you find, like, uh, and I want all the panelists to, to comment on this, because we know that some are really a lot harder to actually work through the process. But I tell you, if you get through SBDC's due diligence, that actually does say something about you. You've actually got a, a, a real check mark on, on that. Um, which ones did you find at your different stages? Because you've gone through these different stages. 
So uh, which did you want to do a shout out to say that they really did help you in your process? So um, in our case, we are a deep tech company, so we need a lot of money and it's a long term, uh, it's a, a long process. So we started from the beginning, like uh, getting a small grants for uh, from Innovate VC that at that time were like a 30,000. Now it's like a, uh, I try to I'd like, I look like how big is the grant and how long it's going to take it. But that when we were starting, that was very important as well. Um, SDC was crucial for us. Um, I didn't know that was very diff difficult to get it because um, I'm a technical person. So when I, I had to expose and present what the company was doing, uh, I was very prepared. SDC has been very good with us because uh, they have been supporting from the beginning and keeping, uh, keeping their support until now. IRAM have been very good too um, with all the different programs. Uh, I'm super happy working with my uh, ITA because I know that if I uh, message him for uh, a question on um, whatever I need, he's going to be there to support me. I mean, not me, my company. And that mm -hmm. feels very good actually. Uh, but I think that it's not from one day to other. It's what I was saying before. We have been working already around two years. And I noticed that he's proud as well of all the progress that we have been made during this year. So IRAP is a, a very good organization. In my case, as I, in my background, it's, um, uh, I'm a PhD on chemical engineering. Um, I know how to use, work with academia too. So I have a MITAX and I got a MITAX with uh, Professor Neil Branda at uh, is View and have been working amazingly. In fact, we are going to apply to another grant uh, soon. And that has been um, pushing our research. So in that way, we spend the sources mainly in the product development in the areas that need a little bit more of research. We keep it up there. And it has been very helpful for us to kind of um, complement that with uh, academic uh, collaborations. So uh, I should say that um, SDDC, IRAP, and MITAX. And of course, Shred, but Shred is not a grant, but I think that it's amazing to count with uh, the support that we get from the tax, uh, tax credits from Shred. Uh, I mean, it's sometimes uh, when you are in a startup and that money came back and you're like so, so happy uh, that, that the government is supporting you in that way. Right. Actually, that's another one that, um, uh, yeah, so we're going to get you to talk a little bit about um, the the shred part of it in a moment, but Greg was smiling. So I want to make, I want to actually pick on him. And because, so Macarena did give us a really good background on something that we were all aware of. Now, you know, the government also does procurement. And so they, there's maybe some lesser known ways that you work between the non-diluted sources and how those are, maybe you can provide a little insight into how those things do work. Um, uh, through some of those additional ones and your thoughts on those. Sure. I mean, procurement is its own lecture series with the slide deck. Um, but uh, uh, I, if I can just quickly build on, on Macarena's comments, uh, shred. Is, uh, for, so it depends where you are in the um, uh, scaling process or, 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 or startup process. Um, if you're definitely in the smaller space, uh, shred is great. STTC is, is great. I can keep shouting out IRAP because it's it's like the best gold standard handholding program, um, and uh, and and you get a, an ITA, which is uh, it, I think it's I, IT anyhow. You get someone to help you. Is my point, point. Um, and uh, uh, and that's that's a, a, a huge thing. Um, once you sort of graduate out of that, uh, and you sort of at a greater scale. Um, there's programs like the business scale productivity program, which every uh, uh, a regional development agency has some equivalent of that. Um, there's the, if you're you're really on a growth trajectory and you're a clean tech business, which I suspect is everyone on this call, um, the accelerated growth service uh, is like IRAP except for big, um, and is I mean I've worked with a lot of programs with the exception of our vendor obviously uh, best thing I've I've used. Uh, it's it's uh, an awesome awesome program, um, and then to actually answer your question, James. Uh, uh, so the government's first buyer program, which is what it's often called, is uh, Innovative Solutions Canada. Uh, and essentially, uh, you'd work with uh, whoever your client department is and PSP, uh, Public Services and Procurement Canada, PSPC. Um, 
to set up an arrangement where they basically do a small buy of whatever it is you're selling. Uh, and then they will test it. If they like it, they may buy more. Um, but one big sort of stumbling block or issue that I, I mean, I would encourage everyone to avoid uh, if you're whether you're going through the ISC program with PSPC or if you're uh, the Innovation Solutions Canada program with that's technically I said, but through Public Service and Procurement Canada, um, uh, or if you're just trying to sell something, you know, because uh, you've already got a first buyer, um, you, you want to do as a pilot project. Uh, your first step always wants to be a pilot project because if you sell widgets uh, and those and you go to the government of Canada and say, hey, these widgets would solve all of your problems, and the government of Canada says they would solve all of our problems. Uh, and then the government of Canada says we should buy this. Uh, and it goes back to our conversation and the question in the chat about risk. Uh, and they say, okay, are we going to buy these widgets from little company X or should we pay IBM to recreate them? Uh, and so you want to do a pilot project. So you built that trust. So you've built that credibility so that when they go to buy widgets, uh, they say, okay, well, we know these people, they know they deliver on time. We know that, you know, what they say they're selling there is what they're actually selling. Um, because if they go to IBM instead, you've actively created a competitor for yourself. Um, and so it's going through the process in a way that's smart um, and, and leveraging the, the pressures that are within the system to uh, help government to uh, do as practices, which I'm sure is everyone on this uh, at, at this panel's product, um, but, uh, but without uh, uh, having government to take on additional risk, which they won't do. Sure, thanks. Uh, yeah, so you were uh, commenting a little bit about I said, um, or do you want to build on on that? And I, I don't know if you're right. Um, we want to get a little bit of this about. We keep talking about shred and how important it is to companies. Uh, your thoughts with respect to shred and and how that actually has worked with some of the projects you've been involved with. Yeah, sure. Um, so first, just to just to complete um, and just to comment on what Greg said about the Innovation Solutions Canada, I, I sent the link uh, on the chat if anyone wants to use that. But similar to what Greg said, there are other programs like NRC, National Research Council. They do have a challenge program, like a, actually a large challenge program in different research centers that they have. And they do always post these challenges that, um, that they want uh, industry or academic partners to get involved with. Um, again, another link that I sent is the ideas program, the same concept from the, the Department of National Defense. Um, so they, they are always uh, open to many different challenges and they are having lots of competitions around. So these are all in terms of like the government being the buyer of your technology or actually helping you to test or pilot test the technology. Now going to your questions about the shred, uh, actually um, before even getting to the shred, we do have another program in BC, um, not not uh, not across Canada. That is, uh, we call it the EBC program, the Eligible Business Corporation program. I don't know if anyone is aware or if most people are aware of this or not. But this is not necessarily a direct funding for your company, but it's a tax credit of about the thirty percent of the investors who invest in your company. Um, so this is actually a, a huge amount um, that uh, a huge leverage that you have when you're talking to investors. Um, similar to that, like going back to your point, uh, the shred program is definitely a must use for most of the companies as long as you are doing something like scientific research or experimental development. Um, and um, again, like even when we are talking to companies from the university perspective, we are always um, talking about how they can leverage shred in, in the contributions that they are, they are putting towards um, the collaborations with the universities and how they can use it. I think there was a question um, on the Q&A about like using grant writers and their support. I personally have found their support in Shred um, as the best as the best way to start with. So Shred program, the claims are not usually very straightforward. Um, so at least for the first couple of times, I would definitely suggest companies to use the support from external parties. Yeah, we've seen that too. Because uh, if you do it wrong, you're you're just going to end up getting audited, and that's a real problem. And then there's real issues with respect to if you get changed as far as where you're. Uh, majority ownership is as you move if you move to the US and majority of capitals coming to the US, it could uh, dramatically impact your shred. So there's working with those experts is is absolutely important. I mean, there's been uh, so much shout outs. I can see uh, everybody's been glowing about the things that your um, that NRC IRAP does. Um, I'd like to uh, maybe you can comment on because you know this is for a lot of it's for multiple stages of companies. This is not you're not just working with early stage or late stage, um, maybe you could give some insight into um, areas that, are there areas that you don't 
that you won't touch or that you like better? And uh, what are the uh, things like the amounts that you can actually provide capital to? Because I, I have some experience that they, these can get pretty significant. But then, you know, as far as your relationship, if you are moving from past the advisory side to the uh, working on the funding, What's that relationship actually look like? Because maybe you can comment on uh, broader, it's not just yourselves, but there is real reporting issues and it can be a time issue. And Macarena can probably comment on both that as well, how much time is involved in these things. But if you could give some a sense of what that relationship looks like. Okay, uh, first question, you know, uh, where do we help? You know, uh, there's a common miscon misconception that our financial contributions go to go towards resolving technical problems only. That's not true. As I said, we are advisory and networking services. And our focus is to help remove pain points for SMEs, including access to capital and financing, hiring of highly qualified people, export readiness and market access, productivity enhancement, strategy, strategy development, and technology insights. So, the service is broader, right? And uh, now at what stage of companies do we work with? We work with all stages of companies, right? Um, our value proposition is that uh, we work with and visit SMEs uh, as regularly as we can. Uh, that is one of the job requirements. I'm encouraged to visit and work with my clients on site. So we work with them, we see their situation and then we leverage appropriate tools to solve their pain point at a particular time, right? And uh, so uh, it is not a simple answer I can give you that we give X amount of dollars to this company versus Y amount of dollars to this company, right? So our uh, uh, funding range can go from $20,000 to $10 million per project, right? So it's a very big range. The larger amount of money, uh, we call it large value contributions, was introduced three years ago, and uh, uh, under which you know, uh, we can invest up to $10 million in a company, but, that, uh, but the, the company needs to be going undergoing transformational change. There are some KPIs that the companies need to meet in order to you know, avail that funding. And as far as the, you know, service KPIs are concerned, you know, uh, we we do not have any intake, uh, you know, a, a specific time intake. Our intake is rolling, right? So uh, talk to your ITAs, folks like me, and, uh, you know, invite them on site be ready to receive advisory and networking services. Through that, your ITA will identify which tools, our internal tools or external tools from other, can help you move your remove your pain point at that particular time, right? So, uh, uh, so, and we have different tools, internal tools, to help with the uh, you know finance, uh, uh, helping you you know address your. Uh, technical and business needs. Okay, uh, Macarena, do you want to comment on the uh, on the importance and how the uh, the reporting with the different organizations has worked for your, for you, and uh, give some insights as to how that best can be done? Oof, that is a tough question for me because uh, it's not my favorite part, reporting and the bureaucracy that is involved because it's you have to do it like in any kind of application. So um, now, luckily, I have a, a co-founder that support us uh, with the, all the keeping in track, all these things. Uh, but I think it's important to yeah to be organized and in compliance with the documents um in case of shred uh it's in, um in for us it's like a more the way that we organize information for a future audit or everything but in general we have all the research meetings and uh lab books around so it's uh, easy some, some easy. we don't have to do more work but uh, it's about learning how to communicate with them again, like uh, in thread, you need to be very specific about um, 
uh, scientific methodology and express express all what you do in that terms. Then if you are um, doing um, other kind of grants, maybe they are more, for them it's more important they are, uh, how many employees you get in during that period. Just like, uh, again, uh, be careful about reporting and uh, being compliant with everything. Um, because uh, sometimes uh, they cannot help you if you are not <laughs> doing your part. And the other thing that I wanted to highlight is um, the tax incentives that we have in BC that you were mentioning before. Again, you can do all the, you, you need to do some paperwork, but it's very easy. So I, I'm not sure why not more companies are taking advantage of the, those plants in BC, because it's a very good plan. And right now uh, you can even get, um, it's a uh, collaboration with our RSP. So uh, investors can uh, get money back from the, for their RRSP and as well tax credit. So it's a very good deal to invest in VC. Now I was thinking you the risk your company by um, around 80, uh, 79%. So uh, it's, it's a very, very attractive for them. So uh, as a company, you, you think that you have to always look for all the uh, possibilities that you have and, and manage them and leverage them. Like uh, maybe you get hundreds of investment. You, let's say for uh, the C SDC seed, you need to have a uh, matching funding. So it's like, it's important that if you, you get investment. If you get investment, why you don't try to be a EVC company so then you can offer tax credit. So it's like, a, I think that Canada, and I, I'm very grateful for that. Um, because Europe and other places don't have the same support that Canadian companies are getting, especially in clean tech. So if we are getting all this support and we have a federal government and provisional government that is pushing that direction, we just need to do our work, learn about that and take advantage of that. <laughs> and push our companies, uh, move our companies ahead. Okay, thank you. Uh, Ezra, I know you have to leave, so I'm gonna I'm gonna actually give you one last question because I think it's actually a really important one about how uh, academia and companies work together because there are there are real situations where if a, a company works with academia on a joint development agreement, you can they can actually raise funds in a non-dilutive in a project as opposed to the company. So it doesn't have to be a cap table impact. And you you can actually move the company really a lot uh, forward without having to risk them coming onto your on your cap table. And uh, those those joint developments uh, really can move the move the company a significant way forward. Um, maybe you'd like to provide a commentary and we'll thank you. Uh, because I know you'll have to sign off right at the end of that, and then we'll just continue on for a few more minutes. Yeah, um, so so what you mentioned, yeah, it, this is exactly how we work. Um, so in, there are many, many different instances um, that, uh, the, like when the companies wants to work with universities, they don't have to be worried about, uh, like they definitely don't have to be worried about the cap tables. And as I mentioned earlier, um, the, the only issue, the only thing to think about is what is the university ruling about this specific funding mechanism that you are leveraging and a specific project that you're doing. And it, and it's at the end of the day, it should be something that is fair. So as long as it's, if, 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 the, if you are working with the, with the university so that you can leverage the technology that is being developed at the university, that's a different discussion than if you already have a technology and you just want to need like a second hand to be, or, or a second pair of eyes to look at your technology. This is a completely two different discussions that you will be having. Um, in terms of joint developments or especially when companies from the same ecosystem um, are, are getting together, like they, they have complementary expertise and, and they want to work with universities, um, we do have a lot of this format as like a consortium of the companies working together towards some same challenges or same um, technological questions let's say and university provides solutions for that um usually the way that it works is that there will be some public benefits to all companies like there will be some contributions from all companies and the results of them will be shared between all of the companies or even the public depends on again depending on the funding mechanism that is being used but even for those kind of scenarios we always have in in all the agreements that we do with the companies we always give them the leverage or give them the benefit that they can potentially have like contract research within that consortium format so that they can get the projects that they want for themselves or take out the licenses for themselves. So 
at the end of the day, my message here is that everything is flexible and negotiable. Um, the only thing that to know is like you need to be aware that what is fair for you and what is fair for the university to be involved in your project because you are leveraging something they need to also leverage something. Um, and and again, as I mentioned at the beginning, like we have multiple, many many different examples of many types of different working with the, with the companies, different sizes. So if there are any questions, if you want any examples, if you have a specific. Um, if you need any specific resources from university like UBC, just just come talk to us. Uh, we are here uh, in order to to just clarify this process for you and make sure that you understand how it works. I'm actually going to put my email here in the chat as well, in just in case anyone wants to uh, wants to contact me uh, or have any questions about other fundings um, that I, I can potentially help with. Uh, thanks, Asu. Thank you for uh, joining us today. Much appreciated the insights. And I'm glad that you've circulated your contacts for uh, those that want to reach out uh, directly. So uh, okay, thank you. Thanks for having me. Talk to you soon. Thanks. Thank Have you. Have a good day. Bye. Now, um, uh, Arvinder, maybe you can actually uh, provide some commentary on, we've got a question that um, is not related to yours, but there's, when you, when somebody applies and then they may, you may get a rejection out of that, um in that process how you manage that because you're not going to approve every single thing you do there could be something that um comes as a surprise to the companies but it's a how do you see that building that relationship of managing it because it's not a this isn't you don't consider this a one and done this is a long-term relationship that you expect to develop with these companies so they shouldn't take it as um such a negative that it didn't work on this but because it is that iterative. You want to provide some insight on, on that? Yes. Uh, so I will start with that uh, we are advisory and networking services. I have said it five times already. So okay. hear that loud and clear. You know, so uh, we have limited resources. So we provide advice, networking to grow your company. And, uh, as, and we have smart money which can go towards solving your specific needs as you commercialize your technology, right? Personally, the way I work is, and many of my colleagues, most of my colleagues work like this. We, as I said, we work with you. We are, we do not have an application that you fill out and throw it over the fence and goes a, a, in front of uh, unnamed faces and uh, you know you get an answer yes or no it doesn't work like that we have a proposal if we think that you need financial resources and our tools our financial contribution can make a meaningful i would say <laughs> a contribution or help you in a meaningful way we will invite you to write a proposal and that proposal is a means of gathering relevant information we will still do due diligence. You know, I will have my colleagues involved who we will do project due diligence and financial due diligence. I won't go into in that detail, but usually I do not invite my clients to fill out a proposal if I think they are not ready, right? So there are fewer chances of working with us to get, you know, disappointed, right? But as I said, um, we have limited resources. We cannot fund everyone. And, uh, you know, it needs to, your widget needs to have a realistic and meaningful business potential. Hey, Greg, do you want to comment on that? Yeah. Oh, you're muted. How many years have we been One day here? I'll learn how to use Zoom. Uh, one thing I would add on to the end of that uh, is it, 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 government looks like a black box from the outside, uh, with the exception of programs like IRAP. But it, it's worth noting that public servants are people too. Um, and they are you know, as human as any of the rest of us. If, if you were looking to buy a service, uh, which is essentially what government's doing is they're making an investment, um, you wouldn't just take a cold uh, application and, and look at it. You could, there are, that is that is a lot of what government does, but you'd much prefer to go and have a conversation with someone. Um, and so same thing, you know, when we apply to, to larger programs, 
Um, we don't just go and, as as our vendor put quite well, just throw it over the fence and hope for the best. Um, it, you know, we go and and say, you try and really understand one what the program is trying to achieve, like what outcome is it looking for, um, and two is what are the specific issues that that you know they have or or where they need clarification or where we can build education uh, about a product uh, or that that we're trying to get government to work with. Um, and so it really is having that iterative process. And, and as the, the question in the chat said, uh, around having something that wasn't even relevant to their application, working out those kinks before you get to the application writing process, I wouldn't read whoever wrote that chat or that question in the chat, that issue as being an issue. Um, I would read that as the next time around, you know what their issue, wh where the pain points are and how to speak to them. Um, it, when we work with clients, though, we try and figure that out before we go through all the process, because I understand it's time consuming. Right, right. Uh, Macarena, I'm gonna leave uh, the last question for you. How about working with third party advisors in the process, or should you just do it yourself and engage directly? And then just a quick 30 second, and then we're gonna wrap up. Uh... I think that um, I, I'm paying now for shred, but if I'm honest with you, it's very painful because in general, this uh, organization charge you uh, uh, important percentage. But uh, sometimes as an entrepreneur, you don't have time to uh, do it uh, in a diligent way. So if you don't have time, better you pay. In terms of uh, general grants, I prefer to take care with uh, my co-founder of the, all these grants. So um, for, uh, because, we are very technical, so sometimes not the time that we spend, spend explaining to the grant writer can be longer than the time they takes us to do it in our own. So, um, but it depends in your case, case by case, I guess. But uh, we do it uh, in the house, <laughs> everything. Yeah, I I think that they, uh, for the most part, that's probably a better way because because when you're working with experts uh, like like our vendor and his team they actually you learn and it's important it's important to teach yourself not teach somebody else so i think that's and and then render you probably would agree that you'd rather work with the the team than the their advisors and and, and we, you know sorry yeah, and, we and want to work, yeah we want to work with the team right who is uh you know leading the innovation and uh, you know building the business and uh, uh we discourage involving third parties to write your proposal. We are available, talk to us, right? You're writing a proposal. ITs are there, talk to us, we'll guide you, right? Yeah. So with that, I thank you. I thank you very much for participating with us today. It was very educational. I uh, hope the, uh, I'm sure the audience got a lot out and they can reach out to all of you and connect. Uh, Greg, Macarena, Vinder. Uh, thank you for joining us today, and we wish you all the best. I'll turn it over to Nisha for the last final words. Thank you, James. This was a great session, and thank you, everybody, just as James said, for um, a great session. Please note, we will be taking a break over summer, and we'll resume our next session in September. Thank you, and see you next time. Thanks, Bye, everybody. Appreciate it. Thank you. Bye-bye.